Hi, everyone. I'm Rick Bensignor. Today is Tuesday, May 3rd. Welcome to this week's In the Note Trader Show. As we record late Tuesday morning, markets up nicely today. Um, S&P futures up about 38 points, as is the underlying cash. The NASDAQ 100 up um, almost half a percent itself, whereas the S&P is up double that. Um, we've got the U.S. 10-year at 2.9, uh, we have 2.93%. That's down seven basis points from yesterday's 3% level. Crude oil down about a buck and a half. Natural gas up uh, substantially, up 62 cents now over $8. Um, and uh, the U.S. dollar index down 40 pips today, which is helping gold after yesterday's um, large up move in the dollar and crushing of gold. Um, right now, front month futures for gold trading 1872. So uh, most importantly here is that we are seeing a bounce in the market. We'll talk about that as we get through um, our session today. And let's, let's take a look at what we've got um, in today's show. So in the trader education portion, we're going to talk about how to trade a, a market when the VIX is over 30. Um, and that's where we, uh, well, let's see, where are we right now? We're at 30.4. Um, and it's been higher than that, uh, on, certainly on yesterday's spike. But let's talk about what it's like to trade a, a volatile market, some of the things you can do. In our market overview, we'll take a look at the charts of the VIX, the Dow Jones Industrial Average Tracking ETF, the diamonds, uh, as they're known, because the ticker is DIA, and then the US 10-year chart. And we'll see what that shows uh, heading into tomorrow's Fed meeting. And as far as our sector focus, we'll take a look at consumer staples. We haven't looked at them since February, so it's a few months. Uh, they have been outperforming. We'll take a look if, if um, it still looks like it's going to outperform um, in the sense of let's look at these top names in the group and see what they say. To sign up for my weekly In the No Trader Tactical Trader Report or our 7-Eleven Monthly Spider Sector ETF Report, go to a brand new website at inthenotrader.com. Um, I've put up a media page that has dozens of um, our shows here. These shows from each week are up there um, and a whole bunch of other videos. You can sign up for any of our products. Um, and I want to talk to you about the 7-Eleven report because we just had a new one go out on Sunday night. Um, and again, what's the 7-Eleven report? It's a report that I started doing in August of 2020 with the goal of outperforming the S&P by being in no more than seven of the 11 macro sector ETFs that track the S&P and not that track the S&P that combined equal the S&P. So for instance, the consumer discretionary ETF, the uh, staples, consumer um, uh, what do we say, discretionary staples, financials, technology, et cetera, all the tickers that start with XL, so XLE, XLF, XLK, et cetera. There are 11 of those that, that make up the S&P itself. And what we do is get you in the, no more than seven of the 11 with the goal of keeping the underperformers out of the equation as best we can. And if you can do that effectively, you actually can beat the S&P's return. So let's take a look how we've done uh, recently. In the month of April, we outperformed the S&P by 34 basis points, which um, was a heck of a tough month to trade and you know, allocate. But again, we, we allocate on the first of the month and only in the month of April is the first time since we started the report 21 months ago um, that, um, that we ever did a mid-month update and change of our allocations. Uh, but we still, nonetheless, we outperformed by 34 basis points. In 2022, we're up by 1.88% uh, in the first four months. In our fiscal year, which started August 1st, 2021, we're up 2.75% over the S&P's return. And since uh, in our entire history, which it says 20 months, it's actually 21 months, we are up by 6.1% over the S&P's return. 
these are, if I say myself, incredibly high returns in beating the market. Um, very few people consistently beat the market and we have been able to consistently do it. Again, it's 21 months now and you're seeing the numbers that we put up. Um, if you're interested in beating the market and you have spiders in your account or the next time you're thinking of investing and you're tired of playing the individual stock game, you just wanna do investing in the market itself, consider subscribing to the 7-Eleven Report. History says we will outperform the market. All right, let's, um, let's take a look at how the sectors are doing this year. So here are the 11 sectors. On the far left is the S&P's return. So this is the spider, the SPY, um, down 12.46% as of last night's close. You can see uh, three of the sectors have done worse than that this year, discretionary uh, communication services and technology. Um, the ones on the far right are pretty darn close to what the S&P has done, the financials and real estate. Um, and those just happen to be the way this is laid out. Those in the middle tend to be where we have the outperformance. A um, little bit more cyclical and a little bit more defensive, uh, especially like energy by far um, having a huge outperformance this year. When you think that the S&P is down 12 and the energy is up 38%, you're somewhere in the neighborhoods of a 50% better return having been in energy than the whole market itself. We have a substantial overweight in the 7-Eleven report in energy. Um, you can also see staples pretty flat on the year, utilities pretty flat on the year, um, materials down, but not down, only down half as much as the S&P and uh, healthcare down 7.8%, uh, down a little less than two thirds of what the S&P is down. So those are your best performers. Um, and look, it's not an easy game trying to figure out which sectors to be in. That is what your typical mutual fund portfolio manager is trying to do um, when they allocate their individual stocks and in which, you know, stocks in which sectors and they do top-down sector analysis. Um, and then once they decide how much they're going to allocate to any of their sectors, um, they do bottoms up to pick which stocks they want to be in. But this is the game that essentially everybody on Wall Street is trying to do who's benchmarked to uh, the S&P is outperform it. Otherwise, you know, why would you invest with a money manager over time if they can't beat the market? You might as well just be in spiders yourself. Why pay management fees to people who can't outperform? And uh, what we're telling you is we do outperform and we're doing it consistently. Uh, so, you know, consider looking into our In the No Trader report uh, called the 7-Eleven report. All right. So here's the, you know, the sectors. Now let's, you know, let's talk about what we said would be our trader education portion, which is how do you trade a VIX when it's 30 or even higher? Uh, it's a much more difficult market to trade than when the VIX is 20 or 15, uh, which is a low volatility environment. The VIX, of course, is the gauge of volatility in the market. And um, you have those who simply trade, vol you, you have volatility traders in the marketplace, but most of us are not volatility traders, but we need to kind of have an idea of where volatility is certainly if you're trading options, but, but even if you're not, to understand how to approach a market. Uh, a low volatility environment tends to be more sleepy. It doesn't mean that the market does move up or down, or it doesn't mean the market does move up or down consistently, but it's very methodical and you're not getting the erratic type moves like we saw, for instance, yesterday, where between 3 and 3.30 p.m. Eastern time, the S&P moved 80 points in a half hour, almost 2%. I mean, incredible volatile movement. And you saw it all day um, yesterday from the opening moves where you saw massive moves to finally the midday big washout. Um, and then the, the move that ended up closing up on the day yesterday. So um, really tough trading that. So here's some uh, tips for me on what to do when you have this high volatility environment. 
Number one and foremost, reduce the size of your positions that you're going to trade. So if you're typically, let's just say you have a $100,000 account, and we suggest um, as, as a standard that you're generally not allocating more than 2% to any one trade. If you have you know, a, a trading portfolio, um, we, we generally think smart money management is not to go beyond 2%. Um, so 1 50th of a $100,000 portfolio would be your average trade size is a $2,000 investment in a particular name. Um, if you have a volatility environment that's low, then sure, the $2,000 uh, makes sense. You might even go a touch above. I wouldn't go beyond 2.5% uh, in any one trade because when you're trading lots of different names, you don't want any trade to really significantly pull down your portfolio. So uh, I think the golden rule in money management is about a 2% allocation. However, when you have a VIX that's up where it is now and you're seeing the massive swings that you are seeing, then reduce your size of your positions in, in dollar terms. So if you normally trade $2,000 worth, cut it down, trade maybe $1,000 worth. And you'll see in a second why it's so important to be able to do that. But just before I even get to the other bullet points, it should be intuitive to you that when you have markets moving all over the place, you don't want to trade with the typical size you do because it's very easy to, if you don't have impeccably good timing, it's very easy to get yourself knocked out of a trade with a decent size loss. Um, and, and, you know, kind of quickly have that happen in a day or two. So A, first and foremost, when you've got crazy markets like this, if you're going to trade, reduce the size of your trade. Secondly, and this is something that I've done um, shows on once or twice already this year, scale your trades around your target entry and exit locations. So what do I mean scale your trades? If you're looking to get into a stock at $40 a share uh, because you think it's going to $50 a share, don't put a bid in at $40 you know, your exact entry level that you've determined from your charts or your analysis where you want to get in. In a volatile environment like this, if I was looking to get in, at a, again, as an example, a $40 stock that I think can go to 50, um, then I'm going to bid 40 and a half, 40 and a quarter, 40, 39.75, 39 and a half. At a minimum, I'm going to surround it, you know, with multiple orders above and beneath that area, because I don't want to see myself miss my entry by 10 cents and, and miss the move that I expected to happen. So considering that you shouldn't be paying any commission at all to trade, which is very different than it was years ago, but now it's, you, you should be on a platform that you're not paying any commissions, then take advantage of that by scaling in. And the same thing about if, if, let's say, you successfully got into this trade and you have an average price near $40 and it goes up as you expected it would. And, you know, we are, you, you, you have your, your target price at 50 and then now it's three weeks later. I don't know why the stock moved 20% in three weeks, but it's just what we're, we're uh, saying as an example. And you're getting at 50 again. Would I want to put my one and only sell order in at $50? No, I'm going to scale out because things are so volatile. I don't want to have a spike up that I just miss. You know, imagine if the high ends up being $49.97 and you miss your exit point by three cents and then the stock falls $5. So use multiple entry levels, multiple exit levels around where you want to get in and out simply because there's so much volatility now that there are some crazy moves. And this way, if you're right, you're going to get your average price anyway. But this allows you to partake in some of that entry or some of that exit in case you're not perfect on your entry and exits. And most of us are not. Bullet point number three, reduce the holding period down to days. When you have a market moving like this, it is very difficult 
to play and hold on for months thinking that you're getting into an investment unless you're willing to deal with incredible volatility and the fact that you could be right for three hours or two days and then wrong for the next 14 um, and in a big way. I don't know what's happening next. And I'm a person who, who does this for a living, right? And I'm a strategist that institutions and individual investors pay for my opinion. And I give it my opinion, and, and we'll, we'll talk about what I think is happening now in the market and which way we're likely going to go as we get to looking at the charts. But I think in a market like this, if you're trading, and normally traders are in a shorter term time frame anyway, you have to cut that down to most likely days because the market is going to move enough now that you're either going to get stopped out or make a decent amount of money fairly quickly. So I'm not generally putting on ideas that I think are investment type ideas. These are trades and the market's moving so much now so quickly that in a short amount of time, your trade is either right or it's wrong. If you end up holding it for longer than that, and then it was probably an investment idea in the first place for you. But if you're trading your account when it's really volatile, Generally, you either lose enough or make enough fairly quickly that you want to get it out and not take the chance that the market's in a bigger transitional uh, directional move, whether up or down, that that could go well against what you think is going to happen. So reduce your holding period down to days. And that's what I'm doing now. Uh, you know, I trade, well, I trade everything, but let's even say, you know, S&P futures um, and spiders move so much now that the same thing with the cues, obviously, that in a couple of days, you've either made a chunk or lost a chunk. Well, the goal is not to lose a chunk. Um, and we'll get to a second in a second, one of the other bullet points to try to help on that uh, point of view. But again, think about trading over the next few days, what's likely going to happen. Uh, don't try to figure out what's going to happen in two months from now, because nobody knows. Next, you're going to need to widen your stop levels because of volatility so that you can't put a tight stop in um, when you have an S&P that moves 80 handles in a half hour. So this goes back to and it is in conjunction with the first bullet point, which is why it's important to reduce the size of your position. By reducing the size, it allows you to widen your stop levels so that you don't get stopped out in a, you know, an hour after you put a trade on. So cut down your size and widen your stops. You're going to need to do that because if you don't widen your stops with this type of volatility, you're almost always going to get knocked out of your trade uh, given the up and down price movement that we're seeing over the course of a day, let alone the course of two or three days right now. And then the last one I'm going to say for this, you know, for today's show is, and there's an asterisk here, use options to limit risk. Now, this is, you need to know, understand, and be approved by your brokerage firm to trade options. If you want to trade options, they're going to send you separate disclosure statements that you need to sign that basically says, I understand what this derivatives market is. And I'm willing to take the risks associated with them uh, in order to have the, the right that you give me to play the options market. Nobody's going to let you play and enter an options order if you have not been approved to trade options. For those of you who understand how to use options, when you have a very volatile market, you can use the options market as a way of hedging positions. One of the things that I'm doing now for myself is given the volatility being pretty high, I am willing to sell what are called covered calls against stocks that I own. So if I own 100 shares or more of a stock, I can sell an out of the money upside call against it in order to take in some premium. I'm acting as an insurance company, essentially saying, here, let's, let's, um, I'll give you, actually, let's go to a chart. I'll, I'll give you a, an exact example of something that I did today. 
This is UNG. This is the um, ticker for the natural gas ETF. This inverted head and shoulders that's broken out to the upside. And we had a, a nine count a week ago. We're screaming to the upside now. When I put on propulsion and I switch this to a daily chart, I see that right around 30 and a half dollars, I've got two unrelated targets. One is the stop out level to this 13, that's the red dots. And the other is a propulsion target from the breakout above the screen line that happened today on the gap up. So I'm long UNG in my own account. I have 100 shares or more of it. I'm willing to say that I will sell a week from this. No, actually, I think I picked this Friday. $30 calls. And I was able to sell them for, I think, 70 or 75 cents this morning. They're going to be higher than that now because this is the actual underlines on the high of the day. So for every option I sold at 75 cents, I collect $75. And I'm basically saying I'm willing to be a seller at $30 come Friday's expiration if the buyer of the option wants to take my stock away from me. If they want to exercise the option at $30, which they would do if the stock is trading above 30. If it's not, it would have no reason to say that they want to pay $30. So I'm basically saying that if it trades 30 on Friday's expiration, I'm willing to sell 100 shares for every option I sold. Why am I willing to do that? Because I know that there's some resistance here. And it effectively makes me be a seller at $30.75, higher than, um, than, well, higher than where I'm willing to let the stock go because I collected the premium that's worth $75 for every option I sold. So that effectively makes my sale price higher. And I'm willing to sell some UNG. I've been long UNG from, I'm long UNG in, in the less than $13. Um, so I, I got long UNG down here on this nine count in December. So I've held this for a long time. If, if it trades north of 30 by Friday, I'm willing to sell 100 shares at virtually what is $30.75 because I collected 75 cents in premium. Um, and I'm doing that because I'm looking at where I see targets and where this could easily stall. If it doesn't get there on time, I just pocket the 75 bucks per option I sold. So I'm not going to go into a deeper dive on options. And in fact, I've used up most of today's show, so we're not going to get to the individual names. Let's just take a look at what uh, the markets are doing. But that is one of the things you, I can do in a volatile market is take advantage of the volatility and collect higher than normal premiums simply on a bet that something is going to reach a certain price by a certain time. All right, let's take a look at the VIX. We're talking about a high VIX environment, All right? So the last several days, we've been over 30. This is real time now, we're at 30.67. Um, we did hit this TDST line target uh, two out of the last three days. Yesterday, we spiked above it, got over 36 in the VIX, kind of 37-ish, uh, but we've come in a bit today. Even with the market up like this, part of it is because it's up and part of it is uh, I think there's a near-term sense that the market is stabilizing a bit uh, and, and can hold these levels going into uh, tomorrow's Fed meeting. Uh, so this is the VIX. We told you to buy the VIX down here. We caught the bottom. And you can't really trade the VIX effectively, but um, this is really important to understand volatility if you're trading options. Let's take a look at the diamonds quickly. Here's the Dow Jones, bounced off the bottom of their clouds. Same thing the S&P happened to do this week. Um, so not only are we holding against the lows of the year, but there is support here from the bottom of the cloud. And that's why, you know, temporarily, I think the market's holding on to uh, where it is right now. And then the last thing we'll take a look at is just the U.S. 10 year as we finish up this week's show. And... Uh, I've, I told you a couple of weeks ago, there is a 13 signal here. That is a TD combo signal, the exact opposite 
of how it bottomed. Notice we bottomed on the 13 and nine count in the same week on the all time lows. Here, the 13 and nine slightly spread out. I actually think rates can stall up here. Um, now, that doesn't mean I'm necessarily shorting this as a trade because I don't want to fight the Fed, but I'm certainly not selling bonds out of my own portfolio at this point now. You've had plenty of chance to sell bonds before we saw rates move up this high. So this is a signal. I'm certainly not doing it now. That's it for the show. We'll go over staples next week. And I hope you enjoy things. This is Rick Bensignor and In The Know Trader. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.